He may have started behind the wheel, but his true legacy was what he did to make cars go faster and be safe. His success as one half of a racing juggernaut changed the owner's approach to NASCAR forever. Join us on Men Behind the Wrenches as we take a look at a true legend, Ralph Moody. Next. Born in the Northeast, Ralph Moody was hooked on racing midgets and modified cars in the 1930s. His driving success was only one piece of Ralph's influence on NASCAR. Hello and welcome to Men Behind the Wrenches. I'm your host, Jeff Hammond. Ralph Moody was an early pioneer who migrated south during the harsh winters up north to compete in races around the southeast. By the late 50s, he would settle in Charlotte, North Carolina and retire from driving. It was during his post-driving days that Moody evolved into the most influential car builder of his era. As a teenager, Ralph took to the racetrack before World War II. Each week, the Yankee, as they called him, beat up the competition with his mechanical genius as much as his driving skill. He was known as a, a, a driver of stock cars in the 1940 Ford Coupe, and he had one of the largest flathead V8 engines ever built. And I'm, I'm told that he would drive it to the south over a period of some weeks and get appearance money. He'd unload his luggage out of the trunk, take out, take out the headlights, and then go just lap the crowd, lap the field, all the, the local fan favorites, lap them three times, go take all the money and, and go to the next track. And that's how he supported himself until World War II. There's a lot of smart Yankees around, like there is a lot of smart Southern. They just happened to get down here at the right time and right place. Whether he raced on the beach or asphalt, Ralph knew how to set up a race car. It was kind of wild because if you went down a back stretch where they cut a hole through the dirt to get back on the ocean side, it had a big drop off over the top. And you could look over there and see them. They just pig piled them all up. Guys go over there and jump right on top of the other ones. Sometimes it'd be 40 of them in there, one on top of the other. We used to come up in that area on the modified, and he was very knowledgeable about the setups on cars. And uh, he helped the, the modified boys up in that area and explain things to them and why he came, was sitting in the back of that modified coupe where most of all of us had to <clears throat> drive us sitting in the regular spot. Ralph had a way of setting up a chassis like nobody's ever set up a chassis before, where other drivers would have a wheel up in the air going around a turn. Ralph's car would always be planted on all four wheels, nice and, 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 and stable, and, and he would power through a turn with, with more power on the ground than any other driver of the time. So I think lots of, lots of uh, team owners at the time just wanted horsepower, horsepower, horsepower. My driver can get a win if we have enough horsepower. Ralph saw that it wasn't all horsepower, it was handling, and Ralph was probably the first development engineer to work on a suspension, uh, springs, shocks, and, and uh, gear ratios more than other drivers and team owners at the time. The amazing thing about Ralph's success was that he learned about cars on his own. Uh, Ralph Bodie, from what I understand, is self-taught. I mean, he was just a kid that got his hands greasy at an early age and, and learned mechanics. He didn't just bolt and unbolt things. If something broke, he tried to fix it. If a car didn't handle well, he tried to figure out why it didn't handle well, well and, and how he could tweak it so that it, it would handle much better. So uh, I'm not sure if he ever learned under anybody, but in World War II, besides driving a tank, he was able to learn more disciplined mechanics. And by the time he came out of World War II, uh, he, he moved to Florida, set up a garage, and he was in business repairing cars, doing body work, but mainly it was a way for him to get into racing full time. A lot of people still ask me, how come you knew how to do that then? Because I was racing in 1936. I always built my own sprint cars or midgets or stock cars. And from that time until 1966 was a long time, and I built all my own stuff, and, and I won a lot of stuff with them. And I hadn't learned all that stuff before that. From the dawn of auto racing, Ralph Moody was ahead of his time. His By early 1957, Ralph Moody, the driver, was faced with Ford pulling out its support for auto racing. At the same time, a business opportunity came Ralph's way that would revolutionize NASCAR racing. When uh, Pete DiPaolo was losing the Ford Motor Company racing contract in 1957 because of a ban that was brought in by the AMA, which 
uh, band manufacturer, some auto racing, people in Ford Motor Company said, you know, if we're getting out of racing, let's give this guy home and a shot to set up his own business using our own parts and, and equipment. So they gave him a real good deal on it, and he didn't have the money, so he called who was the hottest Ford driver at the time, Ralph Moody, and said, Ralph, you want to be, become my partner? And Ralph did, had a little bit of money, and he hocked his airplane. He took a loan out on his airplane, and they came up with about $10,000. And Ford gave him a great deal, sold him all the equipment they had here in Charlotte, all the equipment they had in Long Beach, which they trucked here, and, and the next day they were home in Moody. The early days at Holman and Moody were tough, as the company struggled to survive. They would do anything they could to make money, and, and they, they were the perfect team. John Holman, a brilliant businessman, never went to business school. Ralph Moody, a brilliant engineer, never went to an engineering school, yet somehow they meshed and they complemented each other so well. They never got along. After about the second day, they didn't like each other. Being an entrepreneur, Ralph looked at every angle to make a car better and find a way to make a struggling Holman Moody make money. One of Ralph's earliest innovations was shock absorbers. Ralph worked closely with Monroe shock absorbers to develop racing shocks. Prior to this point, stock car drivers used truck shocks on their cars because they were heavy duty. Well, Ralph, again, knowing that it wasn't all heavy duty, there was some finesse involved in handling, developed shocks that had different bounce and jounce and rebound, and worked with company, a Monroe company to build a shock that was a better shock for stock car driving. In 1961, Ford came back into auto racing in a big way and rewarded Holman Moody for sticking with them through tough times. With their support, the organization took off. Hungry young mechanics came to work under Ralph's tutelage. That was the more energy under one roof that's ever been accumulated in racing was Holman Moody. 325 employees, built all the cars turnkey, all the engines, uh, a, we, we, we built engines, crankshafts, solar heads, we designed, uh, we developed engines. I mean, there was so much energy under that roof. But w w what an education. Wilson came in there and said he was a mechanic. He'd just gone through diesel school. Yeah. And he had a little toolbox about this big. That's all he had. But he's one of the ones that wanted to do it. At the time, there was no school like that. There wasn't, you know, just, you could go to no college and learn what you could learn there. And, and not only that, but we worked so closely with Ford Motor Company, and if you could be in that group and work with them, then you could really get an education. Besides grooming mechanics, molding race car drivers was another specialty Ralph Moody enjoyed. Ford had some say, but Homer Moody had their own way of picking drivers for their cars. Many of their drivers worked in the fabrication shop, and the machine shop, the engine building shop, and then kind of dusted their hands off on the weekend, raced the race car, maybe even drove the truck to the track, and then got back in the shop. Names like Curtis Turner, Joe Weatherly, and Dan Gurney drove famed Homer Moody machines in the early days. But Ralph's greatest discovery was a kid from the Midwest, Fred Lorenzen. When I went to Milwaukee the first time to watch, there was a guy up there pulled in with a Ford, just a red Ford, and it just said CPHM, Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's all it said. And there was a, the name of the side was Ralph Mooney. He won two or three of them. Jeez, uh, he comes in here late and he just hooks up in a tow bar and goes home. He was beating the Mercury cars too, so that's why I picked up their name. And when I, we decided to build a Ford, I, and then this Moody gives me his card. He says, listen, you're gonna need some stuff someday, call me. When he went up to um, Chicago and saw this wild kid, Fred Lorenzen, driving a 1956 Ford, and, and one wheel was so far up in the air that the car didn't appear to be stable, it was gonna roll over, and he won the race. And Ralph said, I had to meet that kid because if he, can, if he could win in a car that didn't handle, imagine what he could do with a car that handled. Lorenzen's career at Holman Moody was stunning. From 1962 to 1967, he won 22 times en route to becoming the era's golden boy. In 1964, another superstar emerged from the Holman Moody stables. When Cale Yarbrough went from floor sweeper to race car driver. Cale Yarbrough come along, that little fat guy. What is he going to do, you know? Lorenzen is a carpenter. What the hell is he going to do? You know, every one of them you wanted, they say, no, you know, well, I know the one you wanted. They wanted uh, uh, Benny Parsons. Uh, then I moved to Charlotte and so I could be close to it. Went to work for Holman and Moody, dollar and a quarter an hour, sweeping the floor at the Holman and Moody shop. And uh, so I could be there if something happened, just like I had done at the racetracks. Put me in, here I am, you know, and it, it paid off.
Cale Yarborough's first job at Holman Moody was a carpenter to build crates to ship parts around the country. And, and that's how you got a shot at, hey, how about me? Can I, can I give it a try this weekend? Okay, jump in. And that's how you became a great race driver, by, by using a saw and a hammer. The golden era at Holman Moody had begun. With nothing less than perfection and with drivers like Fireball Roberts, Fred Lorenzen, Cale Yarborough, and Bobby Allison among the names in their stable. Holman Moody put together race teams internally to support each driver. And he said, uh, what's your big gas man? Okay, put gas in a car. Well, I've never even been inside a race truck. <laughs> so I go to Darlington and uh, and I'm just, I was big and strong, so I could pick up a gas can for $15 if you want. But, and you had to turn it up and pour it in a lot. And I think Eddie Lanier and myself were the two gas men. And, and uh, man, I just, you know, I was thrilled. Ralph Moody was the guy who gave me the opportunity. To protect his driver, Ralph came up with a string of innovations to make race cars safer. They were the ones that developed the fuel cells, which uh, after Fireball Roberts' death in 1964, became mandatory. Uh, heavy roll bar structures to keep not only the chassis rigid, but in the event of a very bad crash, protect the driver in a compartment. Uh, inner liners for tires. When a tire went flat, they worked with the tire companies that had a second tire inside them so the car would still be kept up in the air, still in use today. By 1967, Homer Moody's reputation crossed boundaries into all kinds of racing. At Speed Weeks that year, the famed Mario Andretti climbed behind the wheel of their Ford. He started the Daytona 512 and drove his Homer Moody mount to victory in the famed race. The problem we had in the race. Mario couldn't find the pits. When he'd go by, we had a pit there with a big board and everything, but that whole, you know, he just couldn't find the pit. So he, you know, he never got any signals. He didn't have radio. So he ran out of gas. He ran out of gas for at least twice. <laughs> and he'd come from the back of the pack and go out and run again. <laughs> and of course, when he come in and he won the race, he, he was just high in a kite boy, he was something else one day the first time, you know, yeah. and won and all that. That same year, David Pearson signed on to drive for Home and Moody. You know, I said, if y'all want somebody, I want a David. And they say, well, you know, call somebody else. I don't want anybody else, you name it. And I said, if you want to do that, fine. I said, but if you don't, I just really need David. But when I went to Home and Moody and I went in there and seen all those cars being built, you know, two or three dynos, motors sitting there or where and on. And I said, yeah, this is, this is the place I need to be. Pearson and Moody were a perfect match. When he first went to Daytona with our car, boy, he really liked that. He hadn't had much success in that kind of a thing. And uh, he was, he could get it done at that, those places. You know, a lot of people were scared of those tracks, where, which I didn't blame them. If they didn't like them, they didn't like them. But, you know, you can get hurt just as bad on a short track. You can there, too. David Pearson's success with Ralph Moody's guidance would take Home and Moody to NASA. With David Pearson piloting their Ford, Ralph Moody focused on winning a championship for the first time in 1968. Pearson won 16 times and recorded 20 top fives to earn them their first championship in a dominant fashion. You no, know, that's what I try to get Ford to do, was run for the championship. And, you know, see how many they could win with ever who you had, you know, you know. They did two of them, though, and they didn't want to do any more. But they thought back then, you know, if you spend a million dollars, you spend a lot of money. Or two million, or whatever we were spending in. Which was nothing for what they got out of it. When you won that championship that year, it was, you know, we thought, well, this is, this is it. This, this, this is what we've been looking for, you know what I mean? I said, ain't nobody going to beat us, you know. Sure enough, we had a good year that year, and we won that championship, you know. Not a group to let down. Homer Moody and Pearson backed up 1968 for the second title in 1969, winning 11 times and earning 31 second place finishes. It was both years. And a big reason for it was, was the car and David both, because he was consistent all the time. He's always up there, always finished good. And all that season, I don't remember him tearing the car up and not finishing. So we finished the races, you know, always up front somewhere, and won a bunch of them. And you could go home with a car, you know, all in one piece. And, 
And in fact, we had a short track car and a long track car. And that's all we used, those two, all year. You just, well, like I say, walk in a place like home in the Moody's, and it was just like a factory, you know. They had cars sitting everywhere and uh, uh, engine stuff. And like I said, they had, uh, of course, now home and Moody built the engines for everybody, all the Ford teams, you know. So uh, they uh, built some good cars. I really enjoyed working with them. It was about bragging rights, and a lot of it had to do with Henry Ford II's ego. Uh, he wanted to have... He wanted to have the fastest stock cars that won the most against his competition. He wanted to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans with his a car built by his, his own factory, which he did. He wanted to have the best, fastest drag racers, which, you know, with the first funny cars, with gas Ronda and the 427 fuel-injected motors, he did. He wanted to win World Rally Championships with, with the Falcon. He did. It, 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 he wanted to have the fastest power boats, offshore power boats, which Holman and Woody built the 427 tunnel ram for. He did. He wanted to win the Baja with the Ford Bronco and through Home and Moody's Strop in California. He did. So I think it was a lot of uh, wine and cheese talk. Hey, I, I, I'm going to go out and beat you guys this week. And he wanted up beating everybody in every category during the 60s. By 1970, despite all their success, Ford decided to cut back their racing budget. Some of that stuff was coming along in there about the pollution factor in the, you know, in the United States. And they got to a point where everybody's hauling about this and that and the other thing, and they thought they'd be better off pretty soon to get out of, do something to get out of that thing, and which they did. The twilight of the Holman Moody era. By the early 70s, Holman Moody was on the decline. Ford withdrew its support. With their success waning, their personal rift between Ralph and partner John Holman began to break up the organization. John Holman was a very disciplined businessman and went by the book, and it had to make sense financially. Ralph Moody wanted to make race cars go fast, and if he needed a part and they didn't have the money for it, he bought it anyway. Ralph wanted nothing more in the world than to build winning race cars, and John wanted nothing in the world more than to have Ralph build winning race cars. So, uh, you know, John couldn't build cars and Ralph couldn't run a business. Perfect partnership. They were both ends of the spectrum as far as personality and what they cared about. John Holman was a trucker, but a business guy. He wanted to move freight, he wanted to make stuff happen. He cared about business. Ralph Moody loved racing. I'm not sure John Holman cared about racing, <laughs> it's, but he, he really was a business guy behind that. The final days of Holman and Moody were tumultuous. At the end of 1971, Ralph walked away and opened his own organization. With 93 wins and two championships, there was no doubt that Ralph Moody was truly ahead of his time. John Holman and Ralph Moody, just they just flew by the seat of their pants. They were so far ahead of their time, having stock cars, sports cars, research and development for Ford Motor Company, rally cars, drag cars, offshore power boats, off-road racing, and I'm probably missing six other categories they involved. They sold parts. If you were a Ford racer, anywhere in the country, you bought your parts from, from Holman Moody, mail order. You call up or you send in a check. So they were involved in so many areas, it's amazing they could keep it all together. They just put so much energy. I mean, if they had put a wing on the car, just we'd go back and make a die of it and press it out and make the Talladega or the, you know. So the, it was a fun time. I mean, muscle cars, muscle engines, muscle energy. It's a fun time. Through all his mechanical genius, Ralph Moody was an original with a big racing heart. Ralph was uh, good at all. Uh, the thing he was most uh, known for was a chassis part and, uh, you know, what to do to a race car and talk to the drivers and, uh, and talk to them about the lines, take around the racetrack, how to get the car handling better. He was more into that. Now, and, of course, there wasn't any part about the race car he didn't know about. And they made a good team because he knew what to do with building race cars. And, uh, he just had so much knowledge on handling and what you needed, uh, what you needed to make those guys get around the corner. He had 40,000 hours as a pilot um, that he would fly around the country at, to races and whatever. But people didn't know that on the odd weekend or on a Saturday night, if the race was in Darlington, he might fly it up to uh, Milwaukee or something and, and, and under an alias name, race a car. Even though Ford Motor Company said, no more racing, Ralph. He'd get in a car, win the race, and never make it to victory lane. 
get back in the airplane, fly back down to Darlington, where he had to have he had to be the team owner for the next day's race for the Southern 500. Uh, he didn't want a trophy. He didn't want money. He just wanted a race. He had so much in, built in inside him to race, even into his uh, into his 50s. Um, he, he was racing, and Ford never found out about it. Perhaps with Ralph, the sad thing there is that all of his accomplishments are not known. And the thing that made those early team owners and early uh, people so successful was the fact that they knew so much about a car. If you room with him, you know, you, you just, you talk and next thing you know it's three in the morning. I mean, and I love the, the stories that Ralph Moody told me about his race and then I learned so much from it. I, I felt like, you know, he really took me back and brought me up to speed, but he also um, gave me a lot of, uh, he was just a good person. For Ralph Moody, winning was everything. His reputation for fast, victorious cars that lasted the entire race was unmatched in his era. His safety innovations are still used today, and Holman Moody's unprecedented success remains the blueprint for many race teams. He was one of the true geniuses to ever enter the NASCAR garage. For Men Behind the Wrenches, I'm Jeff Hammond, and thanks for joining us.